Hey, Vinyl Community, Jeff here again, and it is time for one of my borrowed series on the first one, the one you never forget. This was by, uh, started a while back by Vance over at Pearl Stage uh, channel, which I'll link to below. And basically what we're doing is we're looking at bands, collections that we have, and how the usually the condition is, or the situation is, the first one that you discovered by the band, your entrance point into the band tends to, and usually because of nostalgic purposes, I guess, tends to be the one that you never forget, tends to be one of the more favorite ones. Uh, and, and it holds true a lot of times for me. I, I know it just, you know, you've got those discovery moments that tend to really lock into your brain. So anyway, today we're talking about docking. And so I've got my records uh, my record's sorted by chronological, the music chronologically, not the release chronologically. So we're starting at the very beginning with the earliest stuff I've got. Um, back in the streets, this is one of the earliest ones I've got. These are recordings. This is an EP, recordings from 1979. That uh, And that's not even the lineup on the album. It's just, this is obviously an unofficial type release. But it was later released, the Lost Songs, 78 to 81, was pretty much all the songs are on here. So it was. this is an official reissue of those songs. So these are the earliest recordings that I have, but it was here, Breaking the Chains. This is where I discovered the band. And even then, this album came out in 81. It came out as a Don Dokken album, then it later got labeled Dokken, and it was released all kinds of overseas places and on different, the, the carrier label and everything. But I did not discover it in the East Coast where I lived until it dropped in 83 on Electra. And so that is where I got my foundation. And I'm going to tell you, back in the day, I was just flipping through bins and looking for anything that looked like this. Anything with long hair, spandex, you know, any of that kind of stuff. And I was just buying it. I didn't know who Dokken was at the time. Like I say, on the East Coast, you know, all we had is magazines. I'm not sure how much coverage you got at that point. But I want to tell you, one of the key things that caught my eye on this release that caused me to buy it was this photo of Juan right here. I just thought that that was such a cool pose, if you could see that. And that just told me, it just screamed, uh, yeah, you know, this is going to be a cool album. Bought it, fell in love with it. Because anything back in those days in the early 80s that, that had hair like that, you know, uh, and and. and the kind of cool stuff that they had just tended to be the kind of band that we would buy. So yes, that this is where I got into them. This is me cutting my teeth a couple years after this album came out, but it finally got major distribution in the U.S. I'd love to find an '81 edition at some point uh, if I ever run across one on vinyl. I'd love to have one of the earlier original ones. Anyway, and then we moved into the 1984 Tooth and Nail, and of course this one I think is what really put them on the chart. This one just, you know, and of course MTV's in full force by now. And so I saw them on this tour. I had to think back because I'm like, I saw them. I know it was on this tour. I thought it was on this tour, but I'm like, I didn't see them till like 85. But, you know, I thought maybe it was the next album's tour, but I looked it up and the next album actually did not come out till November of 85. So I saw them at early 85. So it would have been this tour. And the reason I kind of remember this is because it was either at the tour or just in the store, but I'm going to show a picture here. This is a photo of me in my dorm rooms in the military in 1985. And as you can see, I've got the tooth and nail poster. I've also got if below me there, you can see the wasp poster, which I'm about 95% sure that is the wasp poster, which I've told the story before. Um, I saw Wasp open for Iron Maiden in 1985, and my current wife, who was just a friend at the time, she went with me. Some other friends from the dorms went with me with us, and we were all there. Anyway, she was on one of my friend's shoulders, and you know, so she was up tall. We were ha, quite a few rows back, maybe ten rows back or so, you know, open just in the in the in the general pit there, and she was up on her shoulders, so it made her a target, and. Blackie took this poster and did this kind of obscene thing, rubs it between his legs, and then he beams it right at her. And so it hits my wife, current wife, friend at the time. It hits her. 
she doesn't catch it. It just it hits her. She drops it, and the guy whose shoulder she was on dives for it, throwing her to the ground. She didn't get hurt or anything, but it was just a comical situation. So that poster I came that they gave to me because I was obviously the biggest wasp fan of the group, and uh, and that's it hanging on my wall. I'm almost sure it's, that's the poster that I got. Uh, it was kind of wrinkled, so it's kind of hard to tell in the picture if it was or not. So. And as you can see there in that picture also, there are a bunch of headbands on my lamp. Those seem to be the thing that we're selling at concerts all the time. They sold the headbands. And it probably became popular because of Vince Neil, Motley Crue, you know, who did that. So anyway, that was the Tooth and Nail album. So now we're just going to blow through the rest of the ones we got. Under Lock and Key, another one that really had some, you know, big hits on it there. Back for the Attack, you know, more great stuff. Um, they started, you know, they weren't doing the soundtracks and stuff for Friday the 13th, becoming a little popular. But then, I don't think they did a whole ton after that as far as the popular stuff. You know, live album here. And then most of these, most of these early albums, except Tooth and Nail, well, neither one of the first two. Those last couple, I think, are, are original presses. So, and then I showed this not too long ago. This one of the unofficial dysfunctional ones. Um, not sure. I'm assuming at some point they'll bring out is that Shadow Lock when it came after. And then all of these have been on. Well, these are not. These are not unofficial. I think these are licensed by Night of the Vinyl Dead. So we've got Erase the Slate. So to me, this is really a comeback album. Of course, uh, George is not on this. This is the one where George is not on, right? And this is uh, they get Rev in here, I believe. And it really, you know, I think they really stepped up their game and came back with a vengeance on this album. This whole era is actually some of my favorite stuff too. Long Way Home. And so and these are all numbered reissues. Uh, How to Pay. I believe these are all, yeah, Night of the Vinyl Dead. They're limited pressings, um, but they are, you know, I, I, I believe they are officially licensed. So they're not like the unofficial ones that come from... Who knows where overseas um and then that's it there are a couple albums after that that i think were released on vinyl when they came out and they're really really hard to find now for a decent price the lightning strikes and bone that bones one um yeah so those are tough to get i did pick up the greatest hits i think this one yeah this one's on a green uh this is a re-record of some of their greatest hits so i have that one and then of course heaven comes down the newest album which is not bad. It doesn't sound bad. Um, you know, we've all seen the videos of Dawkins singing online live over the past few years before this came out, and and it, it it's it, it's sad. It sounds sad, really bad. What he's trying to do. So I was really skeptical on how this would come out. But you know, Studio Magic actually sounds pretty good. I mean, he's not the powerhouse he used to be, but this is not bad. You would listen to this and not really necessarily notice so there you go docking one of my early loves again back in those days starting around 81 when we discovered things like molly crew and stuff it just became a whirlwind of rats and dockins and and all the bands that went with that look at the time and we just were buying them up what we could get so that's it for this one though thanks a lot for watching i'll see you later rock on and rock hard